Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Crash Course on Websites with our guest host, Noah Campbell. Noah Campbell is the University of Windsor Gold Lead Medallion Scholar in the Faculty of Science and the winner of the inaugural 2020 APMA Institute for Automotive Cybersecurity Young Cyber Achievement, as well as the 2018 WeTech Alliance YQG Young Professional slash Student of the Year Award. That is a mouthful, Noah. <laughs> As a recent graduate of the University of Windsor, Noah holds an honors bachelor's degree in applied computing with distinction. He also founded WinHacks, the region's first ever post-secondary hackathon, and Border Hacks, a cross-border hackathon funded by the U.S. State Department. Beyond this, Noah also held several positions within BlackBerry, writing training content and championing many initiatives locally, such as the BlackBerry Boot, uh, BlackBerry Boot Camp program. As the former tech community program manager for WeTech Alliance and Invest Windsor Essex, Noah catalyzed digital transformation on our main streets by leveraging over 1 million in support directly to small businesses. In March 2021, Noah joined Wave Direct Telecommunications to lead government relations and strategic projects where he secured over 21 million in government funding for local connectivity projects. Extending from this opportunity, Noah has recently joined Touchless as Director of Government and Community Innovation to create more accessible, connected, and data-driven communities right here in our region and beyond. Thank you for joining us today, Noah. And for our audience, if you have any questions for Noah throughout the presentation, please leave it, leave it in the Q&A tab below, and we will get to it at the end of the presentation. But that's enough for me, so take it away, Noah. Fantastic. Thank you, Leanne. What an intro. It's almost like I wrote it myself because I did, but wow, uh, it's very long. We'll try to reduce that next time around. Uh, best delivery of it I've ever seen, though, so big shout out to Leanne. Uh, folks, welcome and thanks for joining. We're going to do Websites 101 for Startups. Critically important uh, topic because, as we know, through COVID-19, websites have kept many small businesses and startups afloat. Uh, through e-commerce and a bunch of other digital ways to get them noticed and get some business there when the physical stores were closed. Um, and now folks are accustomed to being online, even more so than they already were. So having a good website, critically important. We'll talk about what that means and how to do it, and hopefully how to get a little bit of money from the government to make that happen, because it is, that is something I have some familiarity in. Um, so we'll try to cover all that today, as well as questions at the end. I've got contact information at the end as well, in case we don't get to everything. Uh, sessions being recorded, and I'm happy to email out slides as well. So go crazy on all of the above. You already heard the bio, so I'm not going to uh, bore you with explaining all of these pictures because they're self-explanatory based on the bio. Uh, but what you should know, I work right now for a tech startup based out of Toronto, as seen on the top right-hand side, with Kevin Gervais. He's the co-founder of Touchless Inc. as well as the co-founder of Statflow. He is a Windsorite, so big shout out to Windsor. Um, I'm broadcasting to you live from Leamington, Ontario, inside WaveDirect Telecommunications. They're a fantastic partner and customer of Touchless, and they've given me an office to work out of, which I super appreciate. I previously worked at BlackBerry, creating training content for 16 out of 20 G20 governments, uh, and work very frequently with the Consulate General of the United States in Toronto. Uh, and have organized several hackathons, partnered with Google, and like you heard, uh, graduated from the University of Windsor in computer science. So because I'm talking to you on touchless time, I have to give a quick plug to touchless. Big mission here is enabling a more accessible and connected world for people on the autism spectrum. If you want to learn more about that work, uh, we've got several different podcasts, um, sessions, workshops that we've been on and done and spoken at. Uh, that you can learn more about the importance of that work and some of the in-depth technical stuff we've done to make it happen. Uh, so I got to give a quick plug for that. But let me take you right into what we do at Touchless, how that resonates to what is going to be happening throughout this workshop and what you all should be doing in your businesses, encouraging others to do. If you're a business that provides service to other businesses, this is important as well. Um, so let me break it down here. So, you know, building what we've discovered at Touchless is that building with inclusivity builds for everybody. So on the left hand side, we've got Kevin, like I said, the co founder of Touchless, and with him there is his brother Robert. Uh, both of them are on the autism spectrum, Robert more so than Kevin. And as Kevin had been working through all these different things with Touchless and his previous companies at Statflow, he really discovered 
that working with his brother, you know, the idea of building with inclusivity, building for everybody. So we think about the door sensor that you see on the right hand side. That door sensor, perhaps you've got, you know, a bunch of boxes, some heavy items, and you need to get through that door. And you have the sensor there, you're able bodied, uh, but you're pressing the sensor anyway, even though it wasn't necessarily designed uh, to help you open that door because your hands are full. It was designed for somebody who has mobility challenges and needs that door open for them so they can get through. But even though it wasn't designed for you, you're benefiting from it. So the idea of building for inclusivity builds for everybody, right? And same deal on the web, particularly now. The web has become a very challenging environment. And as we think about COVID-19 and we've been, you know, sitting and working and learning and shopping and doing all kinds of things online, we're not used to the loud, crazy environments of retail anymore. I think about Lush, and I don't like to dox businesses, but they're a conglomerate, so I'm going to do it. I think about a Lush, for example. You walk in there and it hits you in the face. You know you're there, right? From the smells, from the sound, from the staff coming up to you. There's so much sensory overload. And we're, we don't get used to that as much anymore because we've been at home in a smaller sensory environment, staring at a screen, looking at a camera. I used to give this workshop in the actual epicenter in their workshop room with people there talking and interacting and even more sensory environment. Today, I'm in an office with my blinds closed, the door closed, staring at a camera. It's very different. And we're now sensitized to that. Same deal with folks who have autism. The idea of all these different sounds and sites and pop-ups and notifications when you get onto a website, it's distracting. It's a lot to handle. And it impedes the ability to get something done. If you want people on your website to go buy something, having all these kinds of pop-ups, having all these kinds of sounds impedes somebody's ability to get that done, whether they have autism or not. So if we build for the base level and build with inclusivity, we can improve the experience for everybody on the web. That's the thesis here, and that's something I want you to take into each of your businesses if you're trying to do business online. We also have another problem, data. Data is creating friction. We know this. So data ideally drives every key decision, customer interaction, and content experience. However, the reality of this is that businesses are losing more than $3 trillion every year from bad data, and those with disabilities are being excluded from the digital economy until it's fixed. So we know that data is separated. It's stored in apps and silos that don't speak the same language. You may be familiar with that if you've got you know, a website with so many different plugins, so many different things happening on it, and you don't know how to get from point A to point B because you've got so much going on in there. And this, your data is in the same way. We look at messiness of the data. 97% of businesses say their data is poor quality and getting worse. And I love this example here of like the phone numbers. Every single phone number is entered in a different way. It's not standardization, which makes it very hard to reference later. That's super important to consider. We know that this bad data actually hurts revenue. So we know that, you know, because we have bad data, because we have so many different plugins and we have so many different tools being used, we know that Google, and how they've changed their algorithm has made it so having all this kind of bad data and incoherent data and inaccessible content is perform, making you perform poorly on Google. So you hire a, you know, perhaps sketchy SEO service to come in at an exorbitant amount of price to try to fix that, when if you just fixed your content, you wouldn't need that. And we'll talk about really the mechanics of that. And it's ever changing. You know, as businesses grow, it costs more to fix, build, integrate, transform, we're layering tools on top of tools on top of tools to try to get one thing done. You've got three different tools. If we had the right data, we could use the right tool. So when we consider the idea of kind of buckets, if you will, you know, you've got bucket of accessibility, you've got the bucket of speed, and you've got the bucket of bad data. We need to try to address as much of that as we can to make productive, good websites. So I hear a lot of noise about the Google algorithm, the algorithm, all the algorithms. I know a little thing or two about algorithms, spent four years and $50,000 to study about them, um, got the piece of paper to prove it, so that's great. Uh, but what does all this mean? What does Google actually care about? And for a business owner who this, I could care less about an algorithm because they're trying to do their business, they're not some you know, computer nerd such as myself who's looking at this all the time. What they wanna know, what does Google actually care about? 
So regardless of what anybody ever tells you from any kind of company, any kind of organization, if you listen to nothing else from this presentation, the most important thing I want you to take from this is what does Google actually care about? These two things. You can literally put headphones in for the rest of this after I say these things. Don't, but you could, because this is the most important thing. They care about speed and accessibility. That's all. On the, on, the, on the overall level, the thing that determines how well your website ranks and in turn, how quickly people get to you and in turn, how quickly people buy from you and in turn, how quickly you make money, it all comes down to the speed and accessibility of your website. You can spend $11,000 a month USD in SEO tools. I have a business that did this and you won't do as well as if, if you turned all that off and just had a fast, accessible website, and I can prove it, and we'll talk about that. Um, and you'll notice this here. If on the screenshot on the left, this is just a start. I've got so many more, uh, but this is just the start. You'll see before we made, this is a year kind of in reflection. So a year ago, we launched our first kind of website on this platform that prioritizes speed and accessibility, and I'll talk about that. But looking at it a year ago to when it was launched, when we had a high level of URLs that needed improvement and a low level of good URLs, we had issues. When that switched, visitor visits went up. The importance of good URLs is critical and we'll get into like more concrete data, but this is just a preview of like what you should be looking at. You'll see some URLs that need improvement and then you want to flip that on its head. And I'll talk about that. But again, speed and accessibility. So you don't know until you know, which means you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Uh, there's a great tool, pagespeed.web.dev. This tool will crush your dreams, tear it to shreds, does that to me every day, uh, as well as our teams that work on all these websites. It's brutally honest, uh, no holds barred on both mobile and uh, you know, desktop, but it tells you the most important things. It measures your core vitals. So that's what's on the bottom left there, core web, core web vitals assessment. You want to see that as passed. So it's checking things on how quickly things are loading, what kind of delays are on there. Um, on the right-hand side, we're looking at the overall speed of the website. We want to try to load in half a second if we can. And just an overall score on, you know, if we have a lot of unused plugins that shouldn't be there. If we have a high lot of JavaScript and a bunch of big images that take way too long to load, what's that look like and how is that affecting our website? So before we start with anything, we've got to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. And that's why I love this tool uh, because it's brutally honest and we'll, we'll make that clear. So you can save this and use that as your before and your after and during to see how you're doing. These numbers will fluctuate, but ideally you want to stay in that 90 to 100 range if you can on both mobile and desktop. So we can do a local example here, uh, WaveDirect, I'll give them a plug because we put uh, our stuff, you know, our platform with their website and I'm broadcasting from their office right now. So we'll give them a plug. They're a local internet service provider located in Leamington. They really focus in on the rural areas and they're now breaking into the kind of urban areas. So they have service available in Windsor. They have service available in Chad and Kent. And they're really uh, well on track to going province wide. We launched them a new website. Here's what happened. So because we prioritized, and I'll actually I'll go back really quick. You'll notice the website, it's not like a big flashy va va voom situation. It is very basic website, right? It has very basic function, clear language, highly accessible, uh, highly responsive, highly compliant, has a clear function. It's not a bunch of bells and whistles. You don't want that. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because this is, this is why, this shows you why. The results speak for themselves because of how Google prioritizes things. It's so interesting to me that there is an economy of businesses, SEO, set up and centered towards helping other businesses beat the Google algorithm. It's very interesting to me because the way Google does business now, all of those businesses, in my opinion, are going to be in real trouble if they're not going to give concrete, straightforward advice to their customers. And I think that because of how we know that Google has changed their algorithm. We know that they're going to prioritize fast and accessible websites. 
So these are some numbers after launch. Big increase in impressions, big in increase in clicks, increase in um, position uh, from the top to the bottom there. But what's more important than this, because numbers and statistics and all that can be confusing to folks, if you look on the right-hand side, we've got a snapshot of Google search. So Ontario Rural Internet, I told you that's what WaveDirect provides. Take a look here. Um, you know, you'll see the first few uh, entries here, well, all the first, all the top entries are ads, which means somebody paid to be there. They came to a pretty ex high expense. Uh, when, when WaveDirect was doing that, it cost them $11,000 a month USD plus a guy's salary uh, to set all this up. And you'll notice after prioritizing speed and accessibility, the first non-paid result for a very generic uh, search is WaveDirect. It's a blog that comes from an auto-generated page uh, that's just a very basic page, but it's the first result because Google will prioritize speed and accessibility. This is a month after launch. So that creates a savings automatically of $11,000 a month USD plus a guy's salary who is focused on creating these ads to place to rank high. We're ranking first on the first page, which we know as people who use Google, everybody knows you don't really go past the first page. Um, maybe if you're really looking, you'll go to the second page, but that's pretty rare. Uh, so on the first page after the ads, they're the first entry. They don't have a very fancy website, but it does the job. And that's important because that's what Google cares about. More numbers. Obviously, you can see a huge spike. Um, you know, this downtime was when we switched the site and then re-indexed it on Google. Obviously, a huge sp spike in visits. But more important than visits, because visits are great, but for an internet company that has a limited service area, it needs to be in market meaning these folks need to live in the area that you serve. And in market, we saw a four times increase um, in, well, this one is seven times increase of in market address lookups. So just folks who were relevant addresses being directed to the website because they could now find it. Uh, so we saw seven times increase in that. Uh, and then in market leads, you saw four times increase in mark relevant in market leads. So people that we could call and say, hey, saw you were on our website, saw you're a good fit, let's get you some internet, which of course has led to increased sales, which leads to increased revenue. WaveDirect is not a huge company. They have 30 staff, um, you know, a, a significant market share, but they're not a conglomerate, even, even to the degree of an ExploreNet or an MNSI, another rural internet provider. You know, they, they are they punch above their weight because they have invested in the correct technology. So again, when we look at the searches, they're top uh, they're the ranking in the top 10 because of their keywords by a huge margin. And this isn't some fancy SEO tool that did this. It's all just speed and accessibility. Same deal has happened internationally. So we worked with Coons.com, who's in the top uh, 15 auto dealers in the United States. Uh, they're based in Virginia, um, so they run much of the DMV area, Delaware, uh, Maryland, Baltimore, Virginia. Um, sorry, Baltimore is Maryland, same, same thing. I'm still learning my geography. Uh, but we took an auto dealer website, and folks know if you tried to buy a car recently, uh, buying from a dealer website is almost impossible because there's so much stuff on it. There's so many pop-ups. There's so many windows. There's so many chat bots. There's so many, I have to agree to accept cookies on this thing, that thing, and the other thing. So many cookies, I could open up a bakery, but it's not getting you to what you need. So we did the same thing here. We prioritized speed and accessibility, got their core web vitals up to 100. It loads in under half a second, that 0 0.4, that first con uh, contentful paint, 0 0.4, this is less than half a second. Um, so again, perform high, ace those core vitals, and we'll make it happen. Okay, so getting started, because you're saying, Noah, all this stuff is great, but I don't know where to start, and that's okay, uh, particularly if you're not like tech-focused at all. Um, now, I will caveat, if you are building it yourself, you're probably going to use a tool like a WordPress, a Drupal, a Wix, uh, Shopify, which we'll get into, and that's fine. Because you're using that tool, sometimes, many times, the tool will have bloat. It'll have a lot of boilerplate. It'll have stuff on there that you don't necessarily need, but it is the standard. 
So if you're going to use an out of the box tool, you may not be able to get the performance to that 100 or even in the 90s, the 100s. So don't feel bad about that because you're, if you're using one of these tools, you're probably a smaller business that's just getting started, just trying to get a website out so you can do some e-commerce, so you can make it happen and then invest in different technology. That's totally okay. I'm not going to creep your site and send you an email if I see that it's not 100, so don't worry. <laughs> but as you grow, you'll know what to look for and know how to build so you're building for the future. And eventually, we'll be working on ways to make this as accessible as possible, this technology is accessible as possible. It's very new technology. Um, so we're just building like the core product right now. But in the meantime, I'm not going to call the cops if you're using a standard out of the box CMS, I would probably encourage you to do that. If you're a small business, just keep in mind, you may not be able to hit some of these numbers. And that's totally okay, because of where you are. But you'll know how to improve that score as best as you can. And you'll know what to look out for in the future. So Things we want to look at. Uh, web, these are, this is a comparison of many different common tools. I've used Wix in the past. Um, I've liked it. Obviously, there's some security concerns there. Uh, Drupal's a good one. I've used that in the past. I actually have used everything on here from a website perspective. In terms of absolute ease, for me, it was Wix. Um, WordPress is a little more difficult, and you need to really you know, make some stuff happen to get that working. Uh, Joomla is a good one. It's a little harder, but it's actually performed pretty well. Um, so you've got all kinds of tools here. This is a great comparison of them and some things to look for depending on who you are and what you're trying to do. If again, if you're a startup, Wix is a good hit. Um, and if you're like literally just by yourself uh, trying to make this work, it's just a one person business. Go for something easy to get started just to get out there and we can work from there and improve. Wix also comes with e-commerce um, tools on it. Obviously, you might want to use a different thing for e-commerce, and we'll get to that. I'll show you some comparisons there. Um, but if I was starting right out of the gate and I had nothing else to start with, I had nowhere to start, I didn't know anything about anything, I would pick Wix just to get started. Um, if I had a little bit of comfortable familiarity, I'd probably pick uh, WordPress or Joomla. Uh, if I was pretty familiar, I'd pick Drupal. And also, if you're like expert, you actually already have a computer science degree or something related, I'll show you the, the tech behind what we did before. And if you want to use that, you can use that. It's very hard to use um, and generally requires a high degree of expert level technical knowledge, which even I don't really have it at a certain degree um, because I didn't invent this tech stack. Um, but if you want to try to use it, more power to you. I'm happy to share what that is. And that's in some future slides. But if you're starting from the beginning with limited technical knowledge, start with something easy like a Wix or a WordPress. And let's build from there with the knowledge that we need to be prioritizing speed and accessibility and the knowledge that we may not be able to get those perfect scores because of the bloat added by the organizations. So we all that in mind, because I just don't like people getting discouraged when they run their website and it's like showing up at like a 33 out of 100. Um, you can work towards improving that number. So don't get discouraged. From an e-commerce perspective, um, the f but by the way, none of this is sponsored by anybody. So you're getting my honest uh, opinion from, but from an e-commerce perspective, uh, Shopify is by far and above the best option for folks doing straight up e-commerce. Um, yes, it has its kinks. Yes, it can be a pain sometimes, but from a community support perspective, from a adoption perspective, from a flexibility of product and from a funding and partnership perspective, you're not going to do better than Shopify from an e-commerce perspective um, at all, in my opinion. Again, if you want to use Wix and you're not really doing a lot of e-commerce, like because you're just doing a basic website, Wix is a good option. But if you're flat out diehard e-commerce, Shopify, just do it. Um, you know, these conglomerates start to get bloated after a while, but they've got the most resources, they've got the most plugins, they've got the most flexibility and they have the most support. So even if you get started and can't quite finish it, I bet you, you can find a Shopify developer who can help make, get you over the finish line at a pretty decent rate. So Shopify is probably your best bet from an e-commerce perspective. I do have this comparison up so you can see there's some other ones that are okay. You know, WooCommerce is up there. Um, you know, CS card I haven't really used, but um, I've used OpenCart. Zencart is axed like that for a reason. 
It is open source, but it's a mess. Um, so we've used WooCommerce and Shopify, but Shopify is far and above uh, superior as well as uh, if you had to use Wix, I'm fine with Wix as well, even from an e-commerce perspective. So if you're highly technical, uh, this is the this, this tech stack behind how we built our websites at Touchless. So you have over here on the left-hand side, uh, just like Touchless, that's us. We're the ones that bring all this together. And we're using uh, Sanity as our content management system to auto-generate pages. Our database is in AWS. Um, and we're you know, using um, Postgres and AWS as our database. We have some MySQL if you wanted to use MySQL for an on-premise. Uh, and then the framework we wrap all this in is called Gatsby, which is a JavaScript framework. Um, and we use, uh, you know, some different middleware to transport data from our framework, from our website, over into a tool called RudderStack. RudderStack pushes data. It's a data pipeline that pushes it in all these different tools. So your Google Analytics, your Facebook Pixel, your Salesforce, or you can use a tool called MoEngage, using RudderStack to filter your data over uh, and plug that into other tools like Statflow's text kit tool, uh, Twilio, um, all kinds of different communication, one-to-one -one communication tools if you wanted. This is the tech that we use for our websites. But again, if you don't have a full stack developer on, on the team, uh, or if you have no interest in doing that, or you're not going to recruit that, don't worry about this. Know that you can work toward this as you build and grow your business. But I don't want you to stress out about this. I want you to start easy with a site from one of these guys or an e-commerce site from Shopify. And still keeping in mind, speed and accessibility are critically important. So in Ontario, what does accessibility mean? Uh, thankfully for startups, uh, you know, we only have to, I don't like the phrasing of this, but this is how, this is the cut and dry phrasing. You only have to comply with the AODA if you're 50 or more employees. I don't love that. Um, that will eventually change as time goes on. It'll reduce the, they'll reduce the number of employees. Also, you'll see more tools that come available. But all this to keep in mind, you should be working towards this. Because if you're building a business to grow a business, one day you'll probably hit over 50 employees and this will apply to you. And rather than working backwards, you could just start doing it right from the beginning. So I would like you to go and read this and go and understand all this right from the Ontario government website. Yes, other... Um, Websites are great at summarizing it, but you get the verbatim from the government. That's usually where I like to start because I know what I'm getting is the most accurate information and what will be enforced. At a super high level, here are the things that just to get you started in compliance to the AODA and in compliance to accessibility. So this slide, by the way, is not accessible. So don't, don't send me an email. I know. Um, so ne neither is any of this presentation. That's not what that's about. So um, these are, but again, the most key, proper, you know, highlighted things uh, that are easiest to just communicate to you quickly. This is not comprehensive. This is not all of them. Um, that's why I want you to read this. But just to get your mind thinking about what to look out for. Let's get started. So you need to be using headings properly and in the correct order to organize information on your page. I've seen many a time where folks have used a heading in the middle of a page, not to indicate a new section of the page, but to emphasize text. And that brings us into the next point. You know, headers should not be used as a way to make text bigger. A header, something like an H1, a header is literally supposed to be used as a header. This is the title. You also have different levels, levels of headers. So you can have a smaller header to introduce a new section on the page. Do all that stuff, but don't use that to emphasize a paragraph or a sentence in a paragraph. That's what's going to really cause problems. Because it, how screen readers work, so when we think about folks who have visual impairments, they'll generally use a tool called a screen reader. Screen reader will read the page for them and play it back for them, you know, with audio. So the screen reader uses different tags within your code of your website. And even if you don't code, the way you set up your website, there's code happening. Uh, you may just not see it. So the screen reader is looking for these different tags. It's looking for these different codes. 
So if it has tags that correspond with different, you know, text, it will emphasize the words differently and be very confusing for somebody who has a visual impairment. And it's annoying to look at for folks who don't. Uh, so don't do it. <laughs> Same deal with the click here's of the world. Uh, don't use click here as hypertext. Explain in clear English where the link goes and what will happen when the site is selected. Again, think of somebody with a visual impairment. You tell me to click here. Where's here? I can't see that. So I need to know exactly what area I'm clicking, where it's going to take me, and why that's important. We need to be using alt tags and titles with our images uh, to describe what an image is if the image doesn't load. Or if folks have visual impairments and they can't see what the image is, the screen reader will tell it to them. Describe images as completely as you can in the alt tags. Don't rely on color solely as a visual cue. Think of folks who are colorblind. So again, if you know, particularly like the blues and purples and stuff like that, you know, you can't say look for the blue button because that's not helpful. Uh, what's blue? I don't know. Um, so again, you can't use color as a visual cue. Tables only use that for tabular data, right? Numbers that are relevant. Uh, don't use that as the way to control a page. So I've seen many times, particularly on university or big institutional websites, where it's like, here's a table with a picture and an image of maybe it's like a, a staff listing and they put it in a table and they have the person's name and then the image. Don't do that. It's confusing for the screen reader because the screen reader doesn't know how to read through that table effectively. Uh, we need to use bold and italics to highlight text, not underlining to highlight text because underlining indicates it's a hyperlink. So I'm going to click on that 100 times and I get really frustrated when it doesn't take me anywhere. Uh, we want to use less left justification for text because in English we lead, re read from left to right. Uh, so full justification can be confusing for folks. It can also be confusing for assistive technologies. Uh, multiple fonts or inconsistent formatting on a single page just gives me a headache. And the more, uh, you know, Tylenol I have to take, the more problems my liver has. So don't give me a headache. Uh, all videos posted must have closed captioning. That's critically important uh, for many reasons. Uh, folks with auditory impediments, um, just overall understanding of things can be improved with closed captioning. So if you're saying, Noah, how do I do that? I don't have complex video editing software. This is ridiculous. Uh, you're going to go into YouTube. You're going to upload your video. And thankfully, uh, the fine folks at Google have given you uh, free transcription on your video. So it'll generate a script for you. All you need to do within the YouTube studio is go back and edit it and make sure it, it picked it up correctly. Sometimes uh, it mixes words. Uh, folks who make YouTube videos all the time, I'm sure know this, but it can mix up words. So you just have to go through your script while you're in the video editing tool or while you're in the YouTube studio, go back and make sure that you've got your stuff together. And all attached documents must be properly accessible, just like the page itself. Sometimes uh, I used to give this talk at large institutions. I won't name names. But you would give this talk, and they would do pretty good on the page, right? But then they take all the bad stuff that used to be on the page, put it in a PDF, and then attach that on the page and say, for more information, review our, our, our you know, program guide or whatever. Um, and it's like, ah, oh, you did so good until then. Um, so again, if you're going to do attachments, consider it one big entity, right? It's, this is all just continuing to be an extension of not only you know, the website, but it's an extension of your brand. It's an extension of your business. It's an extension of you. When you're an entrepreneur, I'm sure you know, and I'm sure you feel such a um, high degree of personal responsibility for the work that you're putting out, for your brand that you're putting out, that you're investing so much time in. So you want to make sure it's meeting the needs of everybody. Um, and again, the idea of building for inclusivity, and, you know, I don't want to use the word over accommodating, because it's, it's really not, but even if it feels like it, over accommodating means that you're going to be able to build for so many more people, which means so many more customers, which means so much more money and so much more growth for your business. What we also want to consider, of course, uh, mobile devices, please, people. Um, they're not looking at websites on their laptops and on their desktops anymore. It's all on the phones. Uh, prioritize that. People like mobile-friendly websites. 75% of customers prefer a mobile-friendly website. 61% of customers who visit a mobile-unfriendly website are likely to go to a competitor. 
They're using it for price research. They're using it for product reviews. They're using it for purchasing at high, high numbers. The speed is so important. You know, it's, it's, it's what I, I challenge this number of it only being 38%. It's probably much higher. And people just don't, maybe can't articulate or put their finger on why they get frustrated on a website because they've never really had a deep dive thinking about why that is. People get frustrated nowadays because they are used to getting things quickly and they're used to getting things in a way that is, you know, uh, accessible to them uh, because that's what they've come to expect. One good website will set the tone for everybody else. So you're only as good as the worst website on there or the best website on there. I don't know how that kind of turn of phrase would be, but make a good website. That's my summary. That's my turn of phrase. Make a good website and you're happy. Um, so again, mobile commerce, critically important. Usability is critically important. So people don't need to be, they don't want to be zooming in and, you know, trying to scroll all around, find things. We want responsive websites that are actually, if you had to pick, like if you had limited budget or limited time and you had to pick between making the best mobile site you possibly could and making the, or making the best desktop site you possibly could, pick mobile every time. So I really, I, it seems clear now, like it seems uh, obvious to folks, but I just really have to harp on it um, because we get folks really excited, particularly those who are building their website for the first time in like a Wix. And obviously they're generally doing that on a, on a laptop or a computer. And they get really excited about building it for the first time. And they're really only used to seeing it on that laptop because they're the ones building it. But then if you look at that same website on mobile view, it's it's completely jacked up because they didn't build it in a way that is responsive. They prioritized what was right in front of them, which was the Wix website that is on their computer. And they thought, well, this looks good, so I'm ready to go. Not the case. Uh, so again, before you launch, really look at that mobile site, make sure it's responsive, make sure it's fast, make sure those buttons are accessible and make sure folks can do what they came here to do. And more importantly, what you want them to do. If you want them to buy something, they better be able to do that in three clicks on the mobile version of your website or less, ideally less. So keep that in mind. I like this because it's time to tear up a website and time to compare that to another website. So left-hand side, I'm sure these are fine folks at uh, MGBD Parts and Service. Uh, there are Rover P6 Parts Specialists, that's great. Uh, beyond that, I got no idea what's going on on this website whatsoever. So if I look on the left-hand side, that is the menu for the site, which is actually not immediately obvious. I had to take some time to uh, read this. I actually scoured the internet for this picture. Folks who have been to this workshop before will remember this picture. Um, and I couldn't find it uh, when I was doing the slides for this time around because it's been a minute. And I had to scour the internet to find this picture because it's such a good example of what's wrong with websites. And you think, um, oh no, this is something from the 90s. This is not a real website. No, nope, this is a real website. This is a live website. You can go to it. Um, so <laughs> left-hand side, we've got all kinds of stuff going on on this menu. Uh, I have no idea like where to go, where to start. It's all fully on the left-hand side, which is also difficult. The color contrast is really off. Um, and then I've got the weird buyer's guide thing here. It's like sticking out. So it's inconsistent with the rest of the menu. So I'm actually drawn to that after I see the home page. I'm actually drawn to that first. I don't even want to know what happened would happen to a screen reader uh, doing that. And then on, on top of that menu, it appears that at the bottom of the screen, is that another menu? Some of the words there are underlined, some are not. Is this an advertisement? Or is it direct? Like, I'm not really sure what's going on. Overall, like I said, contrast is inconsistent. We've got caps where we shouldn't have caps. Um, we've got click here, which drives me up a wall, but also we have online store underlined. So should I be clicking that? But then there's Rover P6 parts underlined. Should I be clicking that? The only thing that could make this worse is if there were a bunch of chat bots that were popping up while I was on here and a bunch of things asking me to accept cookies and do a bunch of nonsense. Um, and as you can see, as you're listening to me describe it, I'm actually physically uncomfortable. Um, and you are too, because I've now been going on a rant about this. This is where people, they no longer have the patience. They didn't really have the patience before. 
but they really don't have it now. They really don't have it now because they're used to being in this quiet, like I said, quiet, low stimulation environment. So they need something that is calming, quiet, easy to understand, and easy to get started. Like the example on the right. I see where I'm at. I'm at coonscars.com. At coons.com, I've got very few options. And right on the home page, I've got an image that makes me look at one section of the screen and with consistent colors. I got two options. I want to buy a car or I want to sell my car. I click those buttons and I'm getting started. I know exactly what I'm doing. That's the kind of experience you want. You want a calming, normal, anxiety reducing experience. Think about it too. Buying a car is a stressful experience. It's a huge financial investment. Got to do a bunch of stuff. I got to get the right car. I feel like I'm going to get screwed on a bad deal, especially now where there's car shortage, part shortage, all these shortages. It's a stressful experience. I want to do that. I want to, I want the most stress reducing way to do this. And I'll tell you, having a good website will probably prevent me from going into the store and getting stressed out there because I'll get so stressed. I won't even go to the store. So if we are doing these kinds of things, the added benefit we get of not only once people get to the website, they're more likely to stay. Um, but once people get to this website, they got to it because they were able to find it, which is so important because why fast and accessible website with no nonsense, you'll notice there's no chat bots. There's no crap screaming at you when you get onto this site. That's so important because it slows down your website. So when I think about the Wix and the Shopify's of the world, common mistake I see with these is there's so many add-ons and there's so many plugins. And while I said, you're probably not going to be able to get to that perfect 100 on these kinds of tools, you can really improve it by getting rid of unused JavaScript, by getting rid of all these different plugins, by getting rid of all these chat bots that you think are making a customer's experience easier. And that's okay, because that's what's been told to you. That's a lie. It's not making anybody's life easier. It's making your life harder because you have another avenue you need to check. It's making the customer's life harder because they have all this crap popping up at them when all they wanted to do was click a button to buy a car or sell their car. They didn't want to talk about it. They just want to get started. So again, keeping it simple will improve your accessibility score, will improve your speed score because you don't have a bunch of stuff bogging down your website. It helps you with your indexing on Google so you don't have to make a huge investment uh, in SEO and all this stuff that you don't understand. I don't understand it either. When they explain to me these, uh, I had somebody explain to me once they're doing a lot, writing a lot of schema related to the J JSON LD and to optimize our rankings. What does that mean? I have a computer science degree. I don't know what that means. Graduated with distinction. I have no idea what he's talking about. What I do know is that results of speed and accessibility speak for themselves, and that's critically important. And that, and I know that by prioritizing speed and accessibility, we're able to cut out thousands of dollars of monthly recurring costs and still rank higher than we did with all that cost. So maybe you're 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 getting it by now because it's I just stand here on this pedestal and continue to say it, but speed and accessibility is so critically important. And it's a lot of work to wrap your head around because your brain wants you to, you know, you think, you think the more avenues you have to communicate with the customer, the more likely you're going to make a sale, but you also have more avenues to turn them away if things are not done in a way that's super accessible for them. So it's critically important that we prioritize simplicity, speed, and accessibility. So maybe you're going to hire somebody to help. Um, because you have some budget, you got a grant, um, you don't want to do this yourself, you're busy running your business, and that's totally okay. I'm not saying uh, you need to do that. But I do see a lot of people get roped into some unfortunate contracts and unfortunate arrangements with vendors. So I have put together some questions and some topics that are super important um, to cover with your whoever you're going to engage before you do it. So I always ask about core vitals, speed and accessibility, obviously. I should just wear a t-shirt that says speed and accessibility because that's what I'm going to continue to harp on because that's, again, what Google is looking for. So if you're talking to an SEO guy, you're talking to a web dev, 
ask about core vitals. What do you know about them? What's your goal for speed? If they tell you something like, yeah, we want to get this to load in half a second to a second or two seconds even, I'll even accept that. Um, but if they don't have like a speed goal, that's a red flag. How to, and then on the accessibility side, if we're looking in Ontario, how do you comply with the AODA, right? You could even ask for a portfolio of other sites they did. If you see that portfolio and you see these kinds of things in that portfolio, or we're using for, click here phrases, we're using colors as visual cues. We don't have captions on our videos because we're not just importing them from YouTube. Attached documents aren't accessible. The text is inconsistent and all over the place. Red flag. Okay, so we're asking about AODA, we're asking about their goal for speed, we're asking just in generally their knowledge of core vitals. If they have no knowledge of core vitals, they don't know what you're talking about, say, well, thanks very much for the time. Uh, have a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, we also ask about platforms and plugins. Are they using known platforms and plugins with dedicated support? So, for example, are they going to build you a Shopify site? I hope so. Um, and you know if so um you know great are they going to help you use that to train you on that that's great my biggest red flag on this topic is generally if the company has their own um like website cms that they use and they have their customers use i don't love that because then you're indebted to that company forever you have to keep using them for the length of time of that website i don't love that if you trust the company and you're familiar with it and you're and you like the tool fine but I don't love when they push their own stuff because then you're with them forever. Rules of engagement. What's your timeline for getting this done? We know many contractors who, you know, jump around on timelines on occasion. Uh, they jump around on schedules. How are changes made? What's your rate card? I mean, what's the pricing for various levels of service? And my biggest question here, what's your SLA or service level agreement? I love asking this question um, because you know, it's, it's goes back to the responsiveness of working with that vendor. How quickly are they going to respond to you? Um, you know, how quickly are they going to make changes? How quickly are they going to show you something? How quickly are they going to get something uploaded? Make sure you know what those rules of engagement are. And then post launch, how do we get in touch with you? What are the rules for that? How many times can we talk to you after this launches? And can we manage our site long-term and comfortably on our own? That's a super important question and put the put it to the test put their answer to the test if they say yes you'll be able to manage this for small content changes like adding a page revising a page changing pictures adding a video put that to the test make sure you can do that uh show them other examples where they've had that set up for people it's critically important so keep these questions in mind um when if you're going to look for a vendor now how am i going to pay for this whether you're using a platform or whether you're getting a vendor this ain't cheap. It ain't ever going to be cheap, but it's super important. So there are programs to help you out. Here are two that are uh, highly accessible. Uh, so the Canadian Digital Adoption Program offered by the Government of Canada's Innovation, Science and Economic Development uh, Ministry. Uh, this program will partner you with a digital service provider, uh, provide you funding for the engagement and help you get your website, your e-commerce system, your new POS, uh, your social media plan, all this kind of stuff set up. They'll give you funding to work with an approved vendor to make that happen. It's an excellent program. It's completely underutilized because people don't know where to start. Get on that website. It's CDAP. Um, they will help you. They have folks there to help you through it, uh, help you through the application process. As long as you are an incorporated business in Ontario, uh, you can get started with that. Um, super important. Digital Main Street. I hear a lot of stuff about Digital Main Street and I understand it. Um, I've helped deliver Digital Main Street uh, many moons ago um, and I've seen it now in its current incarnation. At the end of the day, win, lose, or draw, it's still a way to get money quickly. Um, and it, it's money to put down on your website right away. They will be opening a new set of grants in June 2022, which is super important. Uh, that's now. Um, They've done this for like four or five years now where they've given out, it's small grants, usually $2,500 to uh, $5,000, depending on what year it is. Um, but it's direct money you put down for your website. You have to watch a couple videos and you have to do a little assessment thing. And it's, you know, maybe four hours of work for $2,500. That's a pretty good rate. 
um, and it goes directly towards your stuff. It's not taxable. It's really important. So you can get started on these grants right now and it helps you pay for your website. More grants. Uh, WeTech Alliance, partner of the Epicenter, partner of the University of Windsor, partner of so many others, um, has a partner program with Pocketed. Pocketed is a grant platform uh, for um, all kinds of businesses targeting towards small businesses, though. They're based out of uh, Vancouver. Uh, they have a bunch of grants on their website. You go and you make an account. It's free. You can look at all the grants. You can filter and search for grants. And if you want to pay a little bit of money, they will... Um, help like write the grant for you. That's generally for bigger grants, um, but you can get some easy wins off of this platform. If you use the code WeTechX when you create your account, I think you get a discount on a premium membership. I don't know what the discount is now because it changes, uh, it ebbs and flows as they say, but it's a great way to get access to cash so you can pay for all these important things. So I'm gonna pass it back to Leanne shortly, but that's the rant. Um, Again, if you listen to nothing, just listen to that speed and accessibility, prioritize everything. Uh, that's what makes your website go. That's what makes you rank on Google. That's what helps you cut a bunch of ridiculous uh, SEO costs. So prioritize that. You can get started on doing that with tools like a Wix or a WordPress. If you're doing a basic website, if you need an e-commerce website, go for Shopify. Reduce the bloat as much as you can. Um, if you're gonna build it yourself, grill that vendor on the questions I gave you and run it through that checking tool, pagespeed.dev, as they work so you can see how we're doing with speed and accessibility. And you'll be really well off. You want to pay for all that. You've got programs available to do that. Canadian Digital Adoption and Digital Main Street. You can find more through Pocketed. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me on email, LinkedIn. I actually recently took a new job, so I'll be returning to BlackBerry uh, in their technical marketing function. So my after July 5th, this email will be dead, the noah at touchless.inc. So my personal email is there too. Um, you can bug me there and go on LinkedIn as well. But that is the, that is the, the uh, horse and pony show. Is that, a, is that a term? Anyways, that's the rant. There it is. Leanne, back to you. Hey, thanks so much. Hey. Noah. That was a very informative workshop and you covered a lot of very crucial information there. Uh, not going to lie, I went and checked out that website myself. It is, in fact, a website, a functioning website. That's very shocking. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you to all the attendees uh, today. And again, this presentation is recorded. So if you want to go back and see something that Noah said that maybe you didn't grasp the first time around, it will be up on our YouTube channel. Other than that, Noah graciously provided his contact information, so feel free to contact him. And thanks again, Noah. Thanks for having me. Uh, all the best, folks. Stay cool in this heat. Yeah. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> Thank you. See ya. Bye. <laughs>